Welcome to today's webinar on Don't Respond, Contain. My name is Teresa Brunner and I'll be your host for today. Just a couple of quick housekeeping items before we get started with our presenters. First of all, we are recording this session today and we will make this recording available to you in a couple of days. And we'll follow up in an email with that link and some additional information about the content today. Uh, we also will have a live question and answer period at the end of the presentation. Um, you can enter your questions throughout the entire presentation. Um, please look for the Q&A pane at the bottom of your screen and enter your questions there. And then we'll respond accordingly throughout the presentation and at the end. Um, to get started today, I'd like to introduce our presenters. Our um, speakers are Corey White, the SVP of Worldwide Consulting Threat Zero in Education, and Sig Murphy, Consulting Director for Western North America. Gentlemen, would you like to kick this off? Yes, thanks, Teresa. This is Sig Murphy, and as Teresa said, I'm the consulting director here uh, for the Western North America region at, at Silent. And in that role, I oversee all of our incident uh, response, incident containment matters for Silent. Um, and I also oversee our proactive engagements as well. So things like red teaming and other uh, assessments to help our clients improve their cybersecurity posture. Before joining Silence, uh, I, I started at the uh, Department of Defense and spent 12 years as a defense contractor at the DoD Cyber Crime Center. And in that role, I was one of the plank holders, the founders for the intrusion team there. So I, I helped to stand up that team. Uh, we did a lot of work with nation state actors and other advanced adversaries. And uh, I started moonlighting with our um, forensic team, commercial forensic team in 2006, 2007 timeframe. And I started with the uh, TJX investigation as the lead forensic investigator. And I've worked a number of large scale uh, intrusions and, and incidents since then. And uh, when I'm, I'm not working in cybersecurity, I, uh, I'm a, a husband, a father, and you know, when I get time occasionally, a half hour here, half hour there, I also enjoy gaming. So with that, I'll hand it over to Corey White. Hi, it's Corey White. So I'm SVP of the global consulting business here. Uh, I started this uh, silence uh, as employee number 12. Uh, so, you know, six years ago, six and a half years ago, uh, I, I built this consulting business. You know, previous to being here at Silence, I was at uh, Poundstone McAfee Intel Corporation, uh, rebuilt and, and really made the team global as it relates to incident response or forensics over at uh, Poundstone McAfee. You know, lots of lessons learned there. And, you know, I got the opportunity to come here at Silence and, and really make a difference with, we're gonna talk about how we've evolved the, the industry and incident, you know, response to containment in this presentation. So the agenda today, you know, quick and concise. We're gonna talk about the current state of incident response services, you know, what we see out there in the market. We'll go through uh, a case study or two. I mean, you know, Sig and I have many, many uh, anonymized, you know, stories we can tell about what we see out there. And then we're gonna finish off with, you know, why contain and prevent approach is, you know, really the future. It's really what we all should be looking at. Uh, and it's one of the, approaches that we've made possible here at Silence. We'll talk about how that could be used in your organization as well. Great, so if you were all in the room with us today, I'd, I'd ask for a show of hands for how many of you have, uh, have encountered ransomware incidents and, and repeated ransomware incidents over the last year. And chances are that most of you would probably uh, raise your hand. Uh, we, we've had a, a number of new clients approach us that have been kind of wringing their hands working on uh, repeated but related cybersecurity incidents. And um, off, this is really because of the, the, the current paradigm in the industry as far as how companies are, are treating incidents and how they uh, re respond versus contain to those incidents. So the, the takeaway here, often many times, using this traditional model, um, not only are these attacks going undetected for extremely long periods of time, the average, uh, the average time from attack to detection is 197 days. Not only are they, are they going undetected, but then when, uh, when companies are hiring supposed cybersecurity experts and firms out there, 
uh, to do these incident responses, the, the response takes a lot of time, uh, takes a lot of involvement by the, by the clients, and then it also not, oftentimes is not effective in actually addressing the root cause of the intrusion and actually uh, finding and containing the incident itself. So the, this really leads to, uh, in the current paradigm, like I said, it, it, if you kind of go the, the old route and do a traditional incident response, it can cost your organization significant amounts of money. It can cost your organization significant amounts of time uh, interfacing with the response firm, uh, doing investigative work on your, or regulatory required work on, on your end. And uh, it can cause, uh, while all this is going on and all of these things have to occur using that old model, uh, the bad guys are usually still, still active in the environment. Many times uh, while the response is going on, you know, they've entrenched themselves and they're still, still carrying out bad activity. So this can lead to reputational damage or uh, decreased business productivity. If you're having to take systems offline and do a bit for bit image, kind of this old, with this old paradigm, that can cause to a lot of downtime. Uh, one more point I'll make here real quick, just, you know, speaking from a incident response uh, business perspective, I mean, obviously I run the business here uh, at Silence and I've run incident response you know, businesses, you know, before at other companies. The difference is, you know, when you're responding to an incident and I've been at, at, at done incidents where it's taken us, you know, weeks to contain and find the malware, you know, across an organization and, and, and in some of those cases going back, you know, about 10 years ago, we've actually had to rebuild you know, systems or rebuild parts, portions of networks because the malware was so destructive. And you look at the cost that's associated for, you know, to do all of that work, one, finding all the malware and cleaning it out, finding signatures that match it, or IOCs, you know, to match it, and then going through the process of, of the cleanup that has to happen. Well, you know, coming here to silence, you know, having an opportunity to not have to go through some of those, those steps and ultimately saving our, our, our customers' instant response or instant containment customers' money, you know, that's, that's a different business model, but it works very well as a business model based upon the customer. We're going to talk more about what that looks like on the other end, but I want to hit on it here as we're talking about the cost of incident response services. That is one of the areas that, you know, people tend to forget. You know, it takes a lot of time, money, and resources to respond to an incident and ultimately get it clean using a legacy incident response approach. So just a few more stats that some of you guys may have seen out there already in the industry. You know, and what we've seen just internally to silence over the last you know, six, six and a half years, you know, 90% of you know, the host that we install our technology on, we're able to find malware on it that was undetected, unprevented, that, that executed. So that, that number is staggering. There's so much out there that, that you know, people are not seeing that's being missed. Because you know, if you think about it, I mean, I've built malware myself back in the day, and I built new custom malware to do what I wanted to do. In, in my days, it was more of using you know, you know, Metasploit you know, you know, framework to build malware or in different tools. But those types of uh, solutions, again, it's brand new. It's, no one's ever seen it out there in the industry, and hackers are using far more advanced techniques to make sure they can evade, you know, tra evade traditional techniques of detection. And then the second point here, with the spear phishing, you know, making that into ransomware. Ransomware, as you guys know, I'm sure, is a business. It's an easy business to get into and a highly profitable business to get into. And so if I'm crafting my spear phishing attacks so that my ransomware can run, then that's how I make money. That, that is a profitable way for me as a, a hacker to you know, make money. So that's why we're seeing so many increases in these attacks and they're not going away. It is so easy to get done. And these percentages illustrate how easy it is to do. Yeah, that's a really good point, Corey. And, and the other statistic you, you can see up on the slide, the next one is that 90% that of breaches are financial or espionage uh, in, in nature. That, that's the purpose of the, of the breach by the attackers. That's pretty staggering. I mean, they're either after some form of money, be that a, a wire transfer payout or, or you know, various schemes, or they're after intellectual property or, or other types of espionage. And that's uh, really important to kind of frame, frame the, the, the issue at hand. Um, the good news is, is that uh, 
and we, we live this here at Silence. Uh, oftentimes we're approached by, by folks that are not clients, but have, have issues with their breaches and, and 99, over 99% of, of, uh, of the malware that we encounter out there can be stopped automatically through artificial intelligence. And, and so that, that is uh, good news and that's kind of changing the environment, which is uh, one of the things we're, we're talking about today, moving from response to containment. So many of you have probably seen uh, models that represent incident response, kind of the traditional model. Um, what we have up on, the, up on the screen is one of those models, and this is pretty typical of, of most attacks. Uh, first and foremost, on the upper right, uh, we, we see that you know, threat actors gain access, and usually this is through malware, uh, backdoors, misconfigurations, things like that. Um, then we see that they, uh, they do some other activity, usually it's lateral movement um, or, or trying to gain a further, th uh, further threshold for number two. Um, then they're, they're generally after um, either that, that sensitive data piece for the espionage or they're working on, on kind of working towards a, a financial gain uh, and as their goal, which we talked about previously. Um, once the actual attack is detected, we talked about that being, you know, of way over 100 days per, per incident on average. Once that, that uh, threat is detected, then the investigations traditionally using, using the traditional incident response model take hours, if not weeks or months um, to actually investigate. And generally speaking, while these investigations are occurring, the attackers are doing other things. They're, they're, they're furthering their access. Um, they've had such a head start that oftentimes they are quote unquote living off the land using actual credentials at that point. So they are, uh, if you have a remote access uh, in your environment, they're in effect acting as, uh, as your, your legitimate users at that point. And it's really hard to actually detect and fully eradicate. And then uh, finally you have, uh, you have time that it takes to post incident actually get things back to an optimal state. And that's not including any security improvements or, or other measures. Uh, we're going we're gonna to talk about kind of shifting the paradigm, but before we move on, I want to talk really quickly about an example of how this model has failed clients in the past. Uh, I responded to a large and led a large incident response using this, the, you know, this, or this approach back uh, three or four years ago in a corporation that uh, had been we found out had been victimized and compromised on four separate occasions by three different threat actors. And the, the bad thing is the really, you know, add insult to injury item is that uh, when, when we came in to, to do that investigation, we found out that the threat actors from the first set were uh, first it got into the environment eight years prior. And this company had paid for not one firm, but three different security firms to come in and work these incidents. And they never got at the root cause and effectively uh, contained the first cybersecurity incident. So we had multiple actors that had continual access in the environment for a period of over eight years because it was never contained. So how do we do it different? Yeah, and this will be the theme of, of this talk. And you know, we really need to do it find a way to break the vicious cycle here because this cycle if anybody has dealt with an incident in their organization or done incident response you know a few things are true you know there's your low-hanging fruit you know you drive by hacks they're going to happen but then there's a sophisticated threat actors that will come back but they're not going to do a sophisticated attack if they don't have to if a basic low-level attack you know runs and the, this cycle happens they're not going to change. They're not going to evolve and get do anything more advanced. So they'll be successful and you won't even know it's there. And they'll come back again and again. We've seen, you know, companies be hit by the same, you know, ransomware threat actors, you know, every year, you know, coming back over and over again. That is a vicious cycle, you know, or we've seen companies dealing with malware outbreaks over and over again. You know, that is, again, a, a vicious cycle that needs to be broken. Those things can be stopped. That does not have to happen. You know, again, to my previous point with threat actors coming back, when they come back, what if you're armed with more advanced tools and you're able to stop the low hanging basic attacks and respond at a whole nother level? That's what we're challenging this industry to, to get to.
So when you think about you know, stats again, I, we're just documenting some of the research we've done over the years. And, and this one was staggering to me, the fact that you know, come 2021, that 10% of the world economy, which is $6 trillion you know, dollars, that will be spent you know, responding to incidents and managing compromised hopes. Again, you think about that, how can we continue to, to run this industry the way we are when we see how profitable ransomware attacks are and the success of attacks happening? And when you think about the detect and respond approach that the industry you know, has adopted, you know, it is obvious that it is not working, especially when you see come 2021, just a few years away, you know, $6 trillion will be spent on it. And these are the types of incidents, again, if you're a security professional, if you're a CISO, you're responsible for security of the organization, you know, you know, the, the, the mindset of saying, hey, we're going to be vulnerable to an attack, an attack will happen, and we're just going to respond to it. it, that approach will not fly anymore because it ultimately will affect your, your job and, and your company's uh, success you know, to the amount of $6 trillion that just blows my mind. So again, this is an opportunity for us to break this cycle. You know, whether we get, cut this in half or take a different approach to, to security, it is important for us to think differently as it relates to how we respond to incidents and how we look at prevention versus you know, detect and respond. So we just made it to the end of 2018 and into the new year 2019. Woohoo! Uh, if, if looking back, I think if we had to identify a few cybersecurity trends in 2018, I would, I would say that two of the largest ones were Emotet and the continued emergence and changing of Emotet and business email compromise. Those are two things that we constantly have new clients uh, that, that have tried other solutions, other, other firms, other services, and have not been successful. Emotet in particular is really interesting, and it's a, it's a perfect example of how the, the old paradigm of incident response is failing clients, new clients for us. Um, there's been hundreds of versions of Emotet that, since its inception in 2014. The attack group behind it, Mealybug, is uh, pretty savvy. They're a little bit better, uh, better armed, and, and they, they do some things that are somewhat APT-like in that they've constantly tested and honed their malware. They've, uh, they've showed a, a, a propensity to start and stop campaigns. Um, and what that's led to is that's led to uh, evolving uh, forms of this malware. It's now polymorphic. It's now um, utilizes a, a, uh, a C2 proxy to, uh, to do command and control for infected systems. And uh, it's also incredibly virulent. So traditional AV, because it's a polymorphic threat, traditional signature-based AV is really outgunned when it comes to dealing with this. If you, uh, if you have a company come in and do the traditional incident response model and they leave a single system that is, is, is infected before actually um, you know, walking away, then that infection can re-spread to other systems with traditional AV. So we've had a, a number of clients, we've done 100 plus of these, these incidents in the last few years where we've had new clients approach us that are tried, they've tried incident response, they've tried other types of technology and uh, basically have, have gotten nowhere with Emotet because of that, that constant uh, reinfection. And we, using our, our new approach, uh, using incident containment as, as an approach, we've been successful in dealing with that. So this is, uh, this is one of the most costly and destructive pieces of malware out there because it is incredibly uh, virulent and spreads via multiple different mechanisms. Uh, as you can see up there on the screen, it costs uh, government victims up to $1 million per incident. You multiply that across all of the victims and, it, and it's pretty crazy. One of the other things that's, that's really interesting that I, that I touched on earlier is that uh, the attackers are constantly updating the malware. So if a system's infected, it, it kind of acts as a botnet where they can actually send new modules down to the infected hosts. And we saw this in 2018, where they sent new, uh, a new module that had a completely different activity than the pre previous uh, purposes and, and, and versions of the malware and caused a greater uh, spread, but also greater alarm. And so um, that's really important to, to be able to bring the right tools to the fight and the right approach to the fight with things like Emotet. 
again, this is another vicious cycle that we have to break. You know, the fact that, you know, non-silenced customers, you know, we've done over a hundred incidents over the last three, four years, just on this particular type of malware by itself. Again, alludes to the fact we have to break the vicious cycle. So you gotta be asking, is there a better way? You know, there has to be a better way, right? Well, there is. You know, what we've created is what we call prevention-based incident containment. This is the future. This is the way we need to look at incident response, you know, in the future. You know, I, in, in all of our, you know, conversations, when we talk to customers and we talk to prospects, I let them know, you know, almost four years ago, here at Silence, we stopped doing incident response, okay? No, uh, no client I've spoken to, no CISO, no one responsible for security have said they rather us come in, respond, and monitor for the next attack. Now think about that, that's incident response and then monitoring for the next attack. That's mostly what the industry is doing, but I've yet to find anyone out there that, that says that that's what they want me to come in and do. When they have an option for me to come in and immediately contain and prevent the next attack. So that whether that's a ransomware, that's, whether that's Emotet, whatever it is, you know, containment and prevention is the future. And, and that's what we built here at Silence. That's what we've been you know, doing for the last you know, four years. That is where we need to take this as an industry, not just within Silence, as an industry. You know, say, okay, a great example, I'm gonna steal his thunder a little bit. Uh, but you think about, you know, our, our children, you think about your home, letting someone break into your house, break the glass into your kid's bedroom, break in, and then when they're in the bedroom, you detected that attack and now you're gonna come and respond. Yeah, I mean, yes, I'll run in, there'll be one hell of a fight, but I'd rather not have that fight in the middle of the night. I'd rather them not break the glass. I'd rather just say, wow, it's my pound on my glass. They didn't get through. That did not happen. And then my prevention and my response is based upon, why is someone pounding on my glass? That's a paradigm shift. You know, instead of getting in and having the fight, I'd rather not have the fight. I'd rather figure out, huh, someone's trying to get in. We blocked it, but why are they trying to get in? Why are they trying to target certain people, you know, in my organization? You know, so that is a different a approach that we need to try to take here. And, and that's what we educate our customers to do. So I mentioned earlier my uh, early career in the DOD and there was a, uh, a phrase that our, our government agency, I worked for a, a, a basically law enforcement counterintelligence agency in the, in, in the government as a contractor, uh, but our executive agency used to say that, that they like to seize all and find all, which you can see at the bottom of the screen. And most security companies out there that you will hire to do incident response using the traditional model have that same mentality even today. Where, where I came from, I, I, our, our team was partnered with Silence. Um, and before I joined the Silence team, I was always amazed at how fast Corey and his team could come in, get an incident buttoned up and contained where we would kind of do this traditional model. And, and the way it works is basically um, uh, the old model, something will be detected. So there's layers and layers of, of cybersecurity tools that require specialized training and specialized personnel and all that, and something gets detected. Then a reaction occurs. So you might have some sensor somewhere that's saying uh, that, that a certain system is, is showing indications of compromise. Then the team will come in and in the seize all find all mentality, they will investigate and for every system that this indicator of compromise is detected on, they will do a bit for bit of forensic copy of that system. And this is extremely time consuming uh, on both the responders part as well as the victim organizations part because you're gonna have to handhold people, you're gonna have to take systems offline, you're going to have to work through a, a bunch of, of kind of uh, hurdles to get those those systems duplicated. And it also requires, uh, really, usually it requires hardware on site, and it can require appliances, sometimes requires agents, things like that. And it's an incredibly slow and methodical approach to doing incident work. So this this literally, that cycle I showed earlier, could take weeks if not months where you're constantly 
taking systems out of the environment, bringing them back to a laboratory, doing the investigation on those systems, finding additional systems that might be compromised, going out, imaging those, repeat, rinse, ad nauseum. So this is a very costly way of doing business and it, it, it is incredibly, incredibly inefficient. But there's a new approach. So Corey mentioned prevention-based incident containment. Is this an oxymoron? So how are you containing things if you're preventing them? No, what we're saying is that we prevent 90 X amount of, of, of the incidents by stopping them before they can occur and then working incidents that actually require it, which is a very small leftover. How does this work? So there's no network taps or monitoring of egress points. Uh, there's, uh, we have a, an approach that utilizes forensic scripts that are based on the operating system commands for the various popular operating systems out there. We have pretty much any flavor of operating system that our clients um, are running. And it's a very low, low drag, low impact approach, uses what we call the principle of least data. So uh, rather than collecting that, that entire hard drive for that seize all, find all me methodology, it uses operating system commands to collect only things that are, are really required to do the investigative work. It's extremely fast as well. So it, it can take on average about eight hours to do a forensic image. That's on uh, you know, relatively small hard drives. Using this approach, we are way more than twice as fast. This can take 20 to 40 minutes for the initial collection. What we do then is we, we can either output it to a local share, if there's a regulatory requirement of concern there, or we can automatically archive the data up and send it back to our laboratory here for analysis. This is all done electronically. There's no you know, boxes or posters or anything. It just, it's sent in a secure fashion. And we have our, our system set up on the other end as kind of a catcher's mitt. So our server is waiting for this data. Uh, once it gets the data, then Silence, we're an AI company. We like to have machines do artificial intelligence and machine learning work to really cut down on the work that's required by human subject matter experts. So we uh, basically bring the data back we then ingest it and we do all of the analysis that we can do in a machine learning fashion and prepare that data for our subject matter experts to, to review. So rather than, than seizing an entire library looking for a specific book in the old paradigm, you're only pulling specific passages out of pages on select books and, and then preparing that for, for consumption by, by the, the experts here. Uh, the most important thing, and you'll see at the bottom of the page is that once this collection is, has occurred, and it can be a matter of a day or a few days, depending on the size of the environment, but once this has occurred, then we already are prepared to, with one single mouse click, turn on containment in the environment. So whereas the old way, you're doing that, that constant and kind of um, really, really time consuming cycle of doing investigation, finding indicators of compromise, imaging systems, you know, pulling them back to the lab, doing another analysis push, doing, and then just repeating and repeating and repeating. We take the whole corpus of information back to the lab. We have the machines do what they're good at doing. We then can quickly um, do post-process those, get them to our examiners to do what the humans are good at doing. And then we say, we're ready to contain. Let's push the button and contain. Yeah. And also just one last point, if we have, you know, prospects or incident response, you know, or containment uh, calls come in and they know they've been hit by say an emotet or, you know, any known piece of, of malware, even unknown piece of, mal piece of malware, but they know what that patient zero or uh, system zero is. Uh, at that point, we are able to quickly install our technology and do that one mouse click and contain it and then push it out to the rest of the organizations. You know, therefore, pretty much instantly, the incident is contained. And on top of that, you take our stat earlier when we said, you know, 90% of the systems we install our technology on, we're gonna find more malware. So malware they didn't even know they had. So we end up containing more malware than, than what they thought. They think of just that one incident, but we're finding a lot more and containing it all at the same time. Whereas you think about, again, other traditional approaches where you're, you know, seize all, find all, or, you know, just searching through a whole environment and looking through all the data to respond to an incident. This is a uh, fairly quick as, as it relates to uh, solving an incident. <clears throat> One other angle I'll talk about, about since we mentioned earlier, ransomware. 
Okay, so we do get take those calls. So when a company, your systems are already encrypted, unfortunately, it's almost nothing we can do about that. But what we can do, going back to my previous points, what if they come back again? You've paid once. And what if it's time for them to come back again a year later or another you know, ransomware you know, you know, threat actor attacks you? Then you just pay the ransom, whatever it may have been, you know, to get it unencrypted or rebuild your environment, whatever you decide to do, and then it happens again. Then you don't have any way to prevent it from happening again. You have the same you know, protection mechanisms you previously had. You need something that can prevent it from happening again. I, I tell my team all the time, you know, I, I don't mind failure. I don't mind going through things, but I only want to go through it once. Let's learn through it, learn from it, and, and figure out how we can, you know, resolve it the next time. Again, a, a way to break that vicious cycle. So, you know, again, how do we do this? How do we approach it? You know, some of you guys may be familiar with uh, Malcolm Harkins. He is our, our CISO here at Silence and obviously he's written a book on managing risk and information security. But this is one of the ways that we've, we've built you know, our structure as it relates to managing risk and getting to prevention first. So I'll talk about one of the approaches as it relates to it. And, and uh, some of you guys may have seen this nine box, pretty simple. It just evaluates you know, your overall risk and cost and you know, from a, on the left-hand side, the control types of respond, detect, and prevent. And on the bottom, you can see control approaches of automated, semi-automated, and manual. So most companies, unfortunately, from a people process and technology perspective, they're up in the upper right, where you know, they're semi-automated to manual with their technology and their processes and people. Uh, same thing with their you know, containment approach. They're more of a you know, detect and respond approach. But unfortunately, with that approach, if, that's, if you're running a security program, that has the highest risk, cost, and the most liability. Where we aim to take our customers you know, with an incident containment and prevention first approach is more of what we call an automated prevention or managed prevention approach. We're leveraging a technology that's gonna you know, prevent that incident from happening as much as possible. Again, nothing is 100%, but you know, I'd rather you know, prevent you know, 99, 95%, whatever it may be, you know, and then do hunting on the last you know, 5% using automated tools and AI-based tools to quickly contain it. But again, training the people on your team to take these automated AI-based approaches using some of the tools that we have, and again, leveraging the process of getting to prevention. You know, these are standards within the security industry and, and IT industry, people process and technology. We've taken that and applied a risk-based approach to it. And so this is how we get people to prevention and maintain a preventative approach across the whole organization. So um, just being in consulting for so long, I've been in uh, the consulting business for 24 years, and you have to, I'm not into making claims and saying, you know, prevention is the way to go without having a way to quantify it. And, you know, in, and when we talk about, hey, how many, you know, incidents, how we contain, how do we contain it, how we maintain con containment, especially if you're, you know, a CISO or a CIO or someone responsible for security, you have to have a way to quantify to your peers, we've invested in prevention, here's what prevention actually looks like. And, you know, how you know if you use one tool to contain an incident or how an incident response company come in and, all right, that incident is contained, but you could have another 100 pieces of malware you haven't seen. You want to be comprehensive. You want to look at your, your real environment. So we built a, a um, really a metric, a report card here. And, and this is an actual customer sanitized, of course. You know, we found, you know, over 7,000 pieces of malware, 34,000 pups. And you know, all of quarantine got them into you know, you know, prevention around all of quarantine. But you see the C grade, we switched from an A to a C, but you see the C grade, this is what they had initially. You know, we still found all the same things, you know, and some of it they were able to manually go through and clean up themselves. But last time I checked, most companies don't have sophisticated uh, malware analysts and threat hunters on their team. And even if they do, it's still a lot of work to go through, again, that 90% you know, the, of, of hosts that has malware on them that they've never seen before. So there is a cleanup process, but there's a good cleanup process that you have to go through to get to prevention. So we took this particular customer to a cleanup process, took them to an A grade. Last point I'll make, 
as it relates to you know, having memory-based you know, prevention and script-based prevention, those are critical. And lastly, asset inventory, knowing how many assets you have and getting these preventative tools on all of your, your assets and securing them. You know, this company you know, got home most of their assets and, and this is a little bit older report card, but one of their action items was to you know, get a better you know, control of their asset inventory, which we ended up helping them get to and, and get up to in the high 90s uh, prevention. But you have to have a way to define prevention. And if you don't have a way in your organization to define what you're preventing, what you're stopping, I see a lot of companies have uh, metrics around, hey, we've detected this many threats and we're seeing this many alerts coming from the sale. How does that actually help you? I mean, those are good stats to know, but that's all clean up and it's all after the fact. You should have a way to determine what we're doing properly to prevent these, these um, incidents and then build on making those stats better. So going back to the battle days, I, I worked at an incident response at a, at a US stock exchange. And quickly we realized that the, the, just the level of attacker we were dealing with and the level of uh, entrenchment that they were able to get before they were detected uh, was going to require shift work. And so we took all of these US-based assets and we said, all right, all right you are working the night shift, you're working the swing, and you're working the day. And it, it was, uh, let's say, um, not optimal to say the least. So here, here at Silence, we have a little bit of a different approach. We, we have teams that are um, in various offices throughout the world that we can tap to do a follow the sun model organically. And that's a really important differential or differentiator for us as well. When we have a large incident that, that, that we are working towards containment on, we will bring, uh, a, a, we will literally do a follow the sun where the US team hands off to Asia PAC, Asia PAC hands off to the EU team, and then EU team hands off to uh, Eastern US again when, when the day uh, is concluded. And that way we can literally work 24 by 7 on uh, incident containment for our clients. So again, you know, as the one who, who built the, the consulting business here at Silence, you know, the purpose of building it you know, is not to, to come in and, and just build another consulting practice. We wanted to be able to, first and foremost, evolve the industry in the right direction. And, and this is an example of doing that, you know, going from incident response and, and monitoring, which I have done in my career you know, over many, many years, you know, but you have to find a better way. So that's why we're bringing forth incident containment and prevention as the new methodology that and frankly the industry should adopt and, and try to approach you know incident response from a containment perspective prevention perspective yeah you know, that really is what makes the difference and you know, as it relates to our, our practice and our business here you know the principle that we, we built it on you know myself and and obviously you know following the leadership of Stuart McClure is making a difference you know putting your company first you know, so what that means is we actually make less profit off of <clears throat> incident response than a lot of our competitors out there. But you know what? You know, what we do is we earn the trust and we succeed you know, together with, with our customers because we made a difference. We've gotten them their, their systems back up and running in a matter of hours instead of weeks. You know, they didn't spend as much you know, responding to the incident you know, because they chose us as that incident response vendor. And on top of that, you know, we were able, had a way to partner with them and maintain prevention for the lifetime that they are a customer. Those are the difference makers that, that we were able to bring to our, our customers. So, you know, that's, that's how we partner in prevention. And that's the goal of our team. That's why we built this new approach. So with that said, we're going to open up for a few minutes for a few questions that you may have. And please, if you do have questions, please go ahead and enter them into the Q&A. Hey, and Sig and Corey, we do have a couple of questions. Uh, let me know when you're ready. We are ready. Okay, the first question is, do you do IR retainers? Yes, yes, absolutely we do. Um, IR retainers, and yeah, it's IR retainers, you know, using it, the, that term is, 
is so ingrained. I've been using that for years. I, I'm, I keep tempting to call it instant containment retainer, but yes, absolutely, we do IR retainers. Uh, and we work closely with, with many law firms and also insurance companies as well. I mean, Sikki, I don't know if you want to elaborate a little bit more on that. Absolutely. So we take um, a little bit of a, of a different approach than, than a lot of folks out there in that you know, we, we will work with you to figure out a retainer that, that uh, a tier of retainer hours that works for your organization, but also fits within your, you know, your insurer or your outside counsel. And then uh, it's good for the term of of the uh, you know uh, of the agreement. So that's usually either twenty four, forty eight, or sorry, uh, twelve or twenty four months. And uh, so one year or two years. And you can also utilize the the hours, any unused hours for proactive services as well. So um, if you're you're getting kind of close to that term or a few, three, four months away from that term, you can, you can utilize that for pen testing or a compromise assessment methodology or anything that, that's proactive to, uh, you, don't, you know, you don't lose those hours, you can still utilize them. Thank you, Sig. Uh, another question is, will Silence Protect ever integrate with web browsers to protect end users from malicious websites? Uh, fantastic question. Uh, we do have that capability, you know, today in in a um, in a, a custom product that, that we've created. Uh, if if you can reach out to to me or, or reach out after this this uh, webinar, then I'm glad to connect you with the the team, and we can talk more about what that looks like. Another question is, how AI can transform IR process. What. You know, I, I think we, we hit on kind of the uh, um, uh, a little bit of a survey of that, talking about our approach to data collection and ingestion. And um, really, I mean, we, could, we could dig a little bit deeper into that, but really here at Silence as an AI company, we strongly believe that we should have, we should set machines up to do machine processing and do what they're good at. And we should we should set humans up to do the you know the human tasks that that their their you know intellect is required for, and so by utilizing um, the approach we talked about earlier, we're basically ingesting um, the forensic artifacts from those systems in a in a pretty well automated manner, and then processing it using our ingestion engines that that do utilize AI to uh, detect malware, pups, and also to, uh, to, to do baselining of activity. So we, we will, our engines, uh, for example, we have an, a, a, an engine that looks at user data. And uh, as part of that ingestion, it, it, it looks at every user account on systems that we collected from. So the larger the corpus of collection, the better off we are. We can have, we have 100,000 systems and the Sig Murphy account uh, traditionally logs on to one laptop between 8 and 5.30, you know, 8 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. on weekdays. And then all of a sudden, we see the Sig Murphy account logging on to four domain controllers at 2 a.m. on a weekend. Then that's one of the things that our, our engine will flag and will say, hey, something needs to be looked at here. Uh, and it will flag it for further consumption by one of our analysts. Yeah, I mean, just to chime into that, you have for, for me, you know, being an incident responder over the years and looking at what we're able to do here at Safe Described, you know, imagine a world where you're able to um, you know, gather the, the correct data, but then all of a sudden come back and, and, and say, wow, this, here's the malware on these systems, here are the pups that are on the systems, and here are potentially the compromised accounts on these systems. Though that's powerful, and that's being you know, I'm automatically done using an AI model based upon the data. So that is game changing for incident response. Thank you. Another question is, can you explain how the AI can identify unknown new malwares and threats? Um, sure thing. I mean, and I, I think I see a follow on question to that is- Yes, uh, there's without, two more, yes. Without knowing that the, the threats, hashes or signatures. And that's, that's a great, Good question. And um, so our, 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 our tools, especially Science Protect, we could give a whole presentation on, on how it works. But, but in short, um, we've trained it using artificial intelligence and machine learning to uh, identify 
uh, things that, that it thinks are bad. So traditional AV, we talked about Emotet before. Emotet's a polymorphic threat. So every time it infects a system, it's gonna try and change itself and make a different signature. And this is really, really hard for traditional AV to, to catch and to convict. And so uh, you need a solution that instead of taking that approach where it has to somewhere in the install base has to see it to be uh, effective at blocking it, Protect works a little bit different. And that basically uh, can identify threats based on what they are, not what they look like. Another question that came in is, how does this differ from ArcServe or other devices on the infrastructure? Yeah, uh, so th this actually doesn't require any, um, any particular devices to be present on the infrastructure at all. So we're, we designed the approach for incident containment to utilize operating systems and operating system commands. And we did that from the beginning um, to basically make sure that we could, we could effectively respond and contain to in the environment. And so uh, I know a lot of other companies, if you, if you buy an, an, a, what, what we call instant response retainer from them, they require a device on the network so they can do playback or detection and things like that. We don't, we don't require that at all. We are looking at um, you know, artifacts on the individual systems uh, and there's a plethora of those artifacts uh, that we can harvest and then run back to our headquarters and run through our machine learning and AI engines to actually uh, to, to effectively investigate. Thank you. Um, our next question is, what tools do you use to perform your incident containment? So we have our, our forensic collection scripts that we, we utilize and we can do that with or without other silence technology. We have uh, a, a model that we can utilize where we, we do bring in silence technologies to do um, that automated containment and the audit automated, uh, we, can, we can basically uh, detect and convict any malicious files. Um, you know, and we can also do uh, an equivalent of a kind of an EDR solution, but it's not required to do the incident containment piece and the collection piece. A couple more questions is silence. Is silence a signature based system? How often do the signatures self update? Uh, great question. I'll take this. This is Corey. Uh, so you know, my background, I spent eight and a half years at, at uh, Foundstone slash you know, McAfee. Uh, and as you know, you know, McAfee is a signature based, you know, company. And you know, one of the basic premises of, of, that we started out with is that we knew signatures that didn't work. And, you know, myself, you know, Stuart McClure and Ryan Perma, you know, we all ended up being what we called AV apologists. Whereas I'm running the incident response team, I'm going into you know, you know, customers having global incidents, and and then you know the question is why didn't you guys stop this? And I had to explain the difference between signature-based you know technology and how you know someone could create new malware and, and bypass it you know at the time. So you know as a result of that, you know we knew that you know signatures didn't work and sandboxing didn't work on and on and on, all the technology that was out back in, in 2012, we had to create a new approach to it. So we don't use signatures at all. It is all based upon a machine learning model that we built. And I can give you a high level how, what that looks like, because obviously I'm not a data scientist. We have a team of smart people that take care of that. But at the end of the day, you know, being able to look at all the known good files and all the known bad files, pull out the individual attributes of those uh, files, which you know ended up ramping up to individuals, you know, six million different attributes. Once we were able to see that, then we were able to train our model on what, if you introduce a new file into that, is what a bad file looks like. Okay, compared to all the bad files we've seen, you know, this is a bad file. So if I create something and just in the processes, you know, you know, exfiltrates data, has C2 you know, capabilities, that's consistent with consistent with the bad files. Or, you know, if I have a file that looks like winword.exe digitally signed by Microsoft, so and so forth, you know, that's consistent with the good files. So the model is able to quickly determine that within, you know, milliseconds, which is, you know, effectively a blink of an eye. That's what our difference is. That's how we approach, you know, detection and, and prevention. And so how we're able to prevent, which is an important point, I don't think we talked about, and be preventative, 
is, you know, instead of waiting until, you know, malware executes and looking at it, we're able to look at it pre-execution. And looking at a, a file pre-execution, uh, so you click on a random, something attached in this ransomware, whatever you click on it, and in the blink of an eye, we look at it and like, huh, no, that is consistent with our bad. We're going to block it. That is how we prevent. So, you know, it's, I mean, we could talk forever on how we built our models and I could get data scientists to come in and speak to it. But at a high level, that's how it works. And those are the key differentiators with our technology and our approach. We have a couple more questions that just came in is what is your typical incident response timeline and how do customers stay in prevention? Yeah, so I, I mentioned on the talk uh, that I came from a, a partner. So doing the traditional response model and I was always really, really floored at how fast and effective the, the silence team was using this model. I didn't have the insight to the model at the time, but um, Erring on the side of humility, so underestimating, I, I will say that we are, uh, we take less than half the time on average, and, and it, it, our rates are about the same hourly, we are less than half the cost, given that oftentimes we are way, way, way more efficient and way uh, lower costing than, uh, than the traditional model. So I talked a couple of times about some examples of, of cases where our teams were, were on site responding to incidents uh, in my old job using a traditional model and we were on site for months at a time sometimes uh, give, given the complexity of the attacks and here at, at silence um, if we had to do that that same attack like let's say the stock exchange example where we were on site for three months plus uh, we could probably contain it i would say in less than a week Thank you, Sig. Um, another question is, if my company has an active incident, how do we um, engage with your, your company or your team? Um, before I answer that, real quick, I just noticed the last part of, the, of that question, and how do we customers stay in prevention? Oh, if my apologies. Notice, yeah, no worries. If you notice in the presentation, we, we show the report card. And again, you know, if, we find, if you have an incident that's based upon one piece of, of malware, um, and we install you know, our technology or we're in the middle of a of uh, doing our uh, assessment using our tools to realize, wow, there's a lot more going on here, then the person will contain you, get you into the highest level of containment possible based on everything in your environment. But that report card using our technology and then regular um, assessments is how we maintain prevention. And, and again, that is that paradigm shift where instead of you know, <laughs> having an incident and then fixing that one incident, not looking at the rest of the environment, making sure that's secured as well, because it could be a back door. That's why we look at the whole network, make sure that that whole network is secured, and then lock you down, you know, based upon that report card, use that as a method, and then come back periodically to check and make sure that that sophisticated threat actor hasn't tried to come back in, which in many cases, they will try to come back in and use different approaches. So you do have to, you know, stay vigilant and keep, you know, um, you know, checking to make sure that there isn't another type of attack vector that they've tried to use. As far as the, how to contact us, we're going to pop a slide up here at the end of the presentation with contact information and uh, feel free to, to copy that down. Thank you. We have one more question that came through and the question is, I assume silence is still a HIDS tool and agent based. If so, what's the coverage compatibilities with OSs and how do you guys handle agent version updates? That's, a, that's a great question. So our collection uh, methodology uh, for, for containment actually is agent -less. Uh, We do have an option to add uh, basically silent technology as, as a, a persistent agent. Um, but we can accomplish the, the collection and, and um, you know, the investigation piece without an agent, so it doesn't need to be updated. And we, we did that by, by developing our collections uh, based on operating system commands. So from the get-go, we, we created this with uh, compatibility in mind. And uh, all the different OS flavors have, you know, obviously there's going to be a little bit, slightly different artifacts present on, on different OSs, but they all have commonalities as well. And these, these collection scripts are able to be run 
and then bring that data back to our catcher's mitt back here at headquarters and, and our servers for processing. And it, it will automatically flag which operating system it comes from and the post-processing engine will, will know how to process that data and effectively get it to the, um, you know, through the AI machine learning um, algorithms and then in a, in a format that can be consumed by our investigators. There's a couple parts to that same question is how does silence deal, deal container? Do you need any profiles for different types of databases uh, like SQL, uh, AWS native? This is actually a really good question at this point in the presentation and it, and it brings up um, a point that um, I, I could have made earlier and that, that's that you know, this, this is our default approach to do this, this OS-based script collection, but we understand that there, due to certain regulatory requirements or other legal requirements, sometimes you have to do the seize all find all on certain systems. And sometimes you have to do uh, specific investigations. So we do have a, a uh, as part of our incident containment team, we have a full forensic lab here at headquarters. We have a, we have a, a full staff of forensic examiners as well to do those targeted investigations. So that can be on things like SQL uh, or other databases. Uh, it can be, we have, we have folks that specialize in cloud forensics for cloud-based uh, you know, ho hosting solutions. And we also uh, routinely will collect things like um, iPhones, um, you know, Android phones, you know, pad devices, uh, POS devices, you name it. And so um, we, we have the capability to handle that, but our standard approach is, is using that operating system level um, approach for collection. Thank you, Sig and Corey. I think those are the questions that we have uh, currently. Okay, so in closing, and this is Corey, I challenge you to, to get to containment and break the vicious cycle that is out there. You know, I, I really think there's a better way that we can, we can respond to incidents as an industry. You know, what we're offering up to you know, prospects here is the incident containment readiness assessment which is a free hour uh, consultation with our prevention experts to really assess what your status is as it relates to being able to contain incidents and get to a preventative state. Our contact information is proservices at silence.com and the 800 number there, 877-973-3336. So again, you can go to our website, you can contact us via email or call us. But again, thank you for your time and let's get you to containment. Thank you, Corey. Thank you, Say. Um, thank you for joining us today, and we hope that you will join us in future webinars. Please visit us at, at www.silence.com webinars for upcoming webinars and webinars on demand. Thank you.